Hello, good morning, everyone. I, my name is Tobias Harris. I'm the Senior Fellow for Asia and the National Security and International Policy Program here at the Center for American Progress. It is my pleasure to introduce a, a truly distinguished panel today at our event, South Korea Chooses a New President. Uh, fortunately, we're able to have this discussion the day after what uh, turned out to be the closest presidential election in South Korea's history. And joining me today, um, our Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, the President and CEO of the Korean Economic Institute of America, and who, she was also uh, the U.S. Ambassador in Seoul from 2008 to 2011. I'm also pleased uh, to introduce Dr. Giyuk Shin, who is the Director of the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford and the William J. Perry Professor of Contemporary Korea, and Mr. Carl Friedhoff, the Marshall M. Bhutan Fellow for Asia Studies at the Chicago Council on Global, Global Affairs, who is a very close watcher of Korean public opinion. Um, and uh, really, it is, it is my pleasure to have this panel here to discuss uh, what we saw yesterday. And uh, before we start, I just want to thank um, our events team, uh, Billy Flanagan and our events team here at CAP, and just want to um, uh, so just a little housekeeping that if you have questions later uh, after the discussion that you can put them uh, in the Q&A function and we'll, we'll, we'll field those um, at that point. So I want to start um, with, a direct, uh, with a question for you, uh, Mr. Friedhoff. Um, we saw the polls were back and forth, were very close right up uh, until the end. Um, even uh, after you had a, a surprise decision in the final week where you had a, a, a Mr. On, the third party candidate, announced that he would pull out and uh, throw his support um, to the eventual winner, Mr. Yoon. Um, I was hoping uh, you could maybe tell us, were you surprised by the outcome? And then maybe walk us through what ended up being you know, decide an election decided by 200,000 votes. You know, what are some of the patterns you saw? Was there any, anything that surprised you? Thanks, Tobias, and uh, very, very great to be here, especially uh, on, on the day after the election. It was, it was a very long night. Um, also been, been a very long day. Uh, but yeah, lots to consider. You know, in, in terms of the election, I wasn't that surprised by the outcome. I had obviously been following the polls very closely. And, you know, they, they all indicated, while well, the most reliable ones were indicating uh, for at least two, three, four weeks that this was going to be a very tight race. And when I talk about the most reliable polls, I'm generally talking about the National Barometer Survey, um, you know, which, which is a consortium of, of polling groups, as well as Gallup Korea. You know, they had this basically 38, 39, 37, 37, um, really tight race. And so that's generally what I expected uh, heading in. Um, and the difference between them, the way that they do their polling is basically through live interviews. They have someone, a live person on the other end of, of the phone talking to the respondent. Um, but because it's not necessarily all about the live interviews, also, I think they're a little more careful, careful with their sampling methods as well. And that's why they were producing polls that showed such a tight race, which felt right at the time. You know, the less reliable polls, and you probably saw some of those as well, they had, they were generally uh, uh, leaning for Yoon, Yoon suk yeol generally plus seven, plus 10. And it was, it was a known bias. And it's not only because of the method that they were using this uh, automated response system, but partly because the, the firms that were doing it, they seemed to be just, just a little more sloppy with their sampling. They were oversampling men. They were oversampling people in their 60s and in older, and that would tend to those are those are groups that we knew were going to lean towards Yoon in general, and so that's why we're seeing uh, bigger advantages for Yoon there. Uh, but as I looked at those kind of in conjunction, you know, I you could see that that Yoon had a little more margin for error, and so he he probably wasn't ahead seven, um, but if he's ahead one or ahead two, and he's somewhere in that middle ground. Um, even if there's late last minute defections, people who change want to vote for, for E.J. Myung, um, still he had a bit of a cushion. You know, one of the one of the wild cards was the the merger of An Chel Su. Um, you know, but when we when we looked at that, there were other polls that were being done before when they were talking about uh, the the candidates merging, and when they took On out, you know, they still had a breakdown in the cross tabs of where his supporters went, and it wasn't a one to one transfer over to to Yoon. It was something like. You know, 35% would transfer to Yoon, 25% would go to, to E.J. Myung, and another 25% said that they would basically have no preference. Now, once he actually comes out and endorses, maybe that changes a little bit, um, but it didn't seem to me that that was uh, a real game changer. You know, it, it may have thrown some support, but it wasn't necessarily, I think, 
you know, something that was going to push you uh, across the finish line just because of the nature of the way that the on, uh, on, the on supporters were, were going to, to fall out. Um, I think one of the surprising things was the exit polls were, were so accurate. Uh, the, again, one of the, the consortium that, that was led by Hong Group Research, they had it. I think the exit poll was 48.4 for Yoon, 47.8 for Lee. Uh, they had Lee exactly right at 47.8, and they were off by uh, two tenths of a point on Yoon. Um, so incredibly accurate uh, from them. And that's with missing the, the uh, early voting. They didn't do any exit polling during that. Now, whether that was by luck or whether that was by skill, maybe a, a little bit of both, uh, but a very good indicator that you don't often see something. Uh, the, the other pattern I thought was, was interesting was that, you know, one, maybe one of the bigger stories that, that will, will come out as we dig into the data a little bit more. And I, I admittedly haven't had a lot of time to do that uh, just yet as far as going through the st statistical tables. But what jumped out initially was Yoon's performance in, in Honam. Um, the fact that in Gwangju, in, in Jalanamdo, in Jalabukdo, he came out with the highest vote totals for any conservative uh, candidate ever. Uh, and all of them were, and, and it's not a huge number, admittedly. It's, I think he, he pulled maybe 12% for the entire region. Um, but that's, he's the first candidate in the first conservative candidate to ever go uh, above 10% in all three of those regions. And you know, there have been some remarks, some speculation that this, this might signal the beginning of the end of strong regionalism. You know, I, I somewhat doubt that. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Uh, but still, uh, that was, I think that was one of the, the more surprising results for me. Thank you for that. Um, and that regionalism question, I, you know, the map is very striking. So maybe, maybe we'll come back to that. But um, I'm gonna go to Dr. Shin now. Um, Last week, as I was preparing my notes for this and, and doing my doing my homework, um, I saw you quoted in the Financial Times saying these are the two worst presidential candidates that South Korea has faced in the democratic era. Whoever wins, I worry about the state of South Korean democracy. I want to give you the opportunity to maybe talk a little bit about, a little bit about what you mean by that, why the campaign was so disappointing, um, and whether the outcome changes your assessment in any way. Okay, good morning and thank you for having me uh, today. Um, you know, when I was watching a uh, Korean election uh, this time, uh, it reminds me of uh, US election in 2020. Okay, so here also, uh, either you are supporting Trump or anything but Trump. Uh, I think in Korea this time uh, was very similar. Okay, so I haven't seen any uh, you know, deep discussion about major policy issues, uh, either domestic or foreign policy, uh, you know, highly negative. Uh, I mean, you know, they are attacking not only candidate, but also, you know, family members. So if you're following Korean election, uh, you may notice that, uh, you, know, you know, neither, you know, candidate spouse, you know, appeared in the campaign. <laughs> you know, basically, uh, you know, each of them made apology and basically disappeared. I mean, that, you know, tells you uh, how bad the election was. Uh, and also, I think going back to maybe, you know, Carl's point, uh, you know, I was a little surprised because uh, in a close election, I was talking to people from, you know, both camp. And I think their internal polls suggest probably uh, UNI is going to win by like three to 5%. Uh, but then, uh, you know, really thin margin. And I think one reason uh, is, uh, you know, opposition, you know, they were provoking uh, anti-feminism. And I think so they were uh, expecting that uh, they can the vote from young male, but then they can split uh, young female uh, through this uh, campaign strategy. And obviously it didn't work out. Uh, I think the poll showed that young female uh, voters actually uh, you know, came to support uh, Lee Jae-myung uh, as a reaction to uh, anti-feminist campaign uh, by uh, opposition. So I think that might a little bit uh, change uh, our expectation uh, in the outcome. So I think in a sense, uh, what we saw uh, was an outcome of uh, democratic backsliding in Korea, which I've been speaking out 
the warning because uh, you know five years ago when Moon Jae-in became president, I had a really high expectation and hope that uh, he can really uh, enhance uh, Korean democracy uh, because he's coming to power after impeachment. But then uh, it was going the opposite direction. And you know, as I mentioned in my you know, you know, different you know, articles, uh, he and his people came to demonize uh, the opposition uh, as evil and then led a campaign to punish them. And I think that really created resentment uh, among conservatives. And I think that's why you know, this time, uh, you know, I may not like my candidate necessarily, but I can let the other candidate be elected. So that's why I think in the end, uh, each side you know, mobilized their people uh, really to maximum degree. Uh, I think that also explain why uh, the outcome was uh, so close. But having said that, I like to make uh, two positive notes. I don't want to be all too critical. So one is, unlike uh, in this country, uh, Lee Jae-myung conceded uh, his defeat immediately without leaving any doubts about the outcome. So I, I thought that's very impressive because he came out uh, even before outcome, you know, you know, was you know, official, and then you know made a very clear statement. Uh, the other one, I was quite worried about this identity politics, especially anti-feminism. I mean, now you know, Korea already divided, you know, polarized, and then they are you know even further polarizing uh, along gender line. But then uh, in the end, uh, it didn't work out. So I was very happy to see that. Uh, this kind of campaign strategy uh, didn't work out. So I'd like to point out those two positive uh, elements uh, from the election as well. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate those positive notes. And I mean, and I would add too, I was struck by the fact that, you know, despite uh, public dissatisfaction with the candidates, um, you, know, you still had turnout that was 77%. So, you know, maybe I, I was a little off last time, but Still, still fairly high, and if the United States had turned out like that, I I wouldn't complain. So, um, you know, th there still seems to be basic belief maybe in, in democratic institutions. Um, Ambassador Stevens, I want to ask you. Um, you know, of course, you know there was a lot of focus on the mudslinging and you know personality clashes and and sort of trivial issues. Um, but I think you know I, I certainly think watching it that you could see. Um, meaningful differences on certain issues between the progressive and, and conservative camps revealed during this campaign. And I thought maybe you could uh, maybe talk about some of those differences, what we saw um, in the race. You know, you know, elections are great snapshots for kind of telling us where politics are at a given moment. And so what, what did it reveal about kind of the priorities of the different camps, um, where they stand, what their, their competing visions for the country are at this point? Yeah, well, uh, again, thank you uh, for me also for inviting me to this. I have such great admiration for uh, for Dr. Shin and Dr. Friedhoff, and it's really a great, so close to the election to have a chance to uh, talk about this with them and hear their insights and uh, and with all of you. Um, uh, maybe, I, I, yes, I do think there, there are different visions, but it took a long time for this uh, campaign to get to the vision thing, if you like. Uh, it really started off being not just about mudslinging, but about the past and a judgment on the, and a harsh judgment on the Moon Jae-in government. Uh, but not, nonetheless, I think you're right. We need to think about what, what the vision is going forward. Uh, I want to add one more thing to, I guess, uh, uh, your comment and Dr. Shin's comment about the, the positive things from this election. I, I also did listen to uh, uh, the president-elect now, Mr. Yoon, uh, give his speech, I guess it was very early dawn, uh, Carl, you're probably still up, uh, when he, he gave it uh, uh, wearing a mask. Um, and, you know, it, I guess you could say it would be the kind of expected thing. He wants to reach out to the opposition. He's going to be the president for all the people. But, you know, I had my doubts about, frankly, whether he would say it because it had been such a nasty campaign. And he has such a reputation of being um, not a traditional politician. So I think that speech, just as uh, E.J. Myung's concession speech, I mean, we, we used to expect this as, as normal in our politics and they no longer are normal. I was very glad to see that. And I thought that I thought that uh, Mr. Yoon hit the uh, uh, hit, hit the mark on that uh, very very well, um, but yeah, with respect to to the policy positions, again, I guess there's a caveat in the sense that both of these candidates, in addition to some of their uh, perceived unattractive qualities as as perceived by the electorate. Um, 
were not terribly experienced. And Mr. Yoon is a complete political novice. He's been a prosecutor, a lawyer all his life uh, after studying for the exam for nine years, which is not so unusual, I guess, in Korea. Um, and uh, and Lee Jae-myung, of course, was an elected politician, but uh, at the at the at the provincial and the uh, and the mayoral level, and did not have foreign policy experience. And they were both not from the main, mainstreams of their parties. So all that said, I think what happened in this election is, as they did have debates, and as the as as the campaign went on, uh, in the debates they began to talk about uh, form teams around them and and talk about. Uh, the policy issues that I think are fairly traditional reflections of, if you like, the conservative tradition in Korea and the and the uh, and the progressive tradition. And although we talk about polarized politics and their very polarized identities, I think there's there's considerable overlap there in some areas. But when it comes to, for example, the domestic policy, which loomed very large, uh, you know, both of them had had proposals for how to how to address uh, inequality, rising real estate prices, which was a huge thing, especially for the younger part of the electorate, uh, and uh, uh, labor flexibility and so on. And Mr. Yoon, representing the Conservative Party, reflected more of a, if you like, business friendly uh, approach, notwithstanding that he is prosecutor personally. And, uh, was uh, was responsible for the prosecution of several major business leaders, but definitely a more uh, less regulation, uh, market economy, those kinds of things. Uh, the Progressive Party more on 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 labor rights, perhaps a more populist approach. At one time, Mr. E. J. Myung was 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 called. I'm not sure in Korea, or the United States, the Bernie Sanders of Korea. I think that's a little misleading, but he did have a, a universal basic income program while he was uh, mayor of uh, Songnam and also while he was governor of Gyeonggi Province. Uh, so, so there was that kind of difference. Uh, when you really look at how they're going to approach it, I think there's a cynicism on the part of the electorate as to whether any of these approaches are really going to work, but there was a difference that was drawn there. With respect to foreign policy, I think similarly, you had Mr. Yoon articulating sometimes a little bit of a rougher edge than even most, I think, more experienced conservative politicians would, a notion of a harder line towards North Korea, more suspicion, being more ready to engage with the United States, uh, uh, both regionally and globally, uh, just leaning more forward uh, into the alliance and expressing more uh, skepticism about China, which again is very much supported by public polling. And I would say for Mr. Lee, it was more a matter of degree. Uh, Moon Jae-in, of course, uh, uh, as president last year, met with uh, President B uh, Biden. They came up with a very robust notion of what the alliance is about. So that positioned Mr. Lee to say, that's what our party does. But of course, he's also trying to say what different he does. And uh, uh, so again, a little bit more of the traditional progressive approach of we need to continue to try to find a way towards a, a stronger inter-Korean uh, reconciliation, uh, pursue dialogue, and so on. So, so, and, and those are differences that do make a difference, I think, especially to to, to different generational parts of the electorate. With the uh, uh, and this gets into the way, and, and Carl's the expert on this, the way it kind of divided up. Uh, people in their 60s tending to vote for the Conservative Party, people in their 40s and 50s for the Progressive Party, and very responsive to the sense that this is these are the values that these two parties represent. So I think that was uh, uh, brought out and brought forward. I think one of the big questions going forward is, again, now with Mr. Yoon as the political uh, neophyte, um, uh, how is he going to execute them, especially uh, with, when it comes down, maybe we'll come to foreign policy later, in a geopolitical uh, uh, atmosphere, which has become even more fraught since this campaign began? Right. Thank you. Thank you all for, for really, I think, thoroughly laying out what we need to know about the campaign. Um, now that we head into the transition period, we have a few months now uh, until uh, Yoon will be inaugurated in May. Um, I want to talk a little bit now with all of you about the post-election landscape, um, because I think there are some important questions that are going to really shape how uh, Yoon governs. Um, Dr. Shin, I want to start with you. And given how slender uh, the victory was, you know, you know 200,000 votes, I mean, very small. Um, and I think more importantly, that you have a Democratic Party controlled National Assembly for the next two years. Uh, what, what does that mean for uh, Yoon's mandate to govern? I mean, how how is he going to govern? You, you now have this uh, France style cohabitation situation that's going to, you know, that you're going to have for, for a couple of years. What what should we expect? You know, you know, what kind of mandate can he claim? How will he be able to actually govern? Okay, so here maybe I can, you know, you know say my wish or hope and then my assessment. Uh, 
I think his mandate is to uh, restore national unity. Uh, once again, uh, Korea is highly polarized um, and then you know, so divisive uh, you know, after this election. And you know, you know, certainly Korean presidency is very powerful. Okay, so he has you know, very powerful uh, presidency. But at the same time, uh, you know, you know, assembly is controlled by uh, Democratic Party, and also the courts uh, will be, you know, unfriendly because uh, you know Moon Jae-in, uh, you know, appointed most of uh, uh, judges in the Supreme Court and constitutional court. And then now, you know, civil society. I mean, the probably civil, you know, civil society are they are very active, and then you know, by and large they are supporting uh, Moon Jae-in government. But they might also, you know, criticize, uh, you know, UN government as well. So, I think you know, he's facing in you know, a big challenge. And uh, as Kathy mentioned, uh, he was career uh, prosecutor, and he got his reputation uh, as uh, like uh, fighting against corruption and power abuse. But he's a new to politics. And I was quite impressed that he's learning very fast. So, you know, when he entered politics last summer, I was a little, <laughs> you know, you know, uncomfortable to see him, uh, you know, make a speech and, and and so on. But then I think toward the end, I mean, he acted like a real politician. So I feel like he's a fast learner, and then hopefully he can understand uh, Korean politics. But nonetheless, I'm not too optimistic. Because one thing, uh, now Democratic Party they lost uh, election, you know, by thin margin. I mean, frankly, they could have won, right? I mean, it's only like a little over two hundred thousand k. So even though Lee Myung conceded, uh, you know, very clearly, probably some people in the opposition party now, you know, they might you know challenge, uh, then cooperate, and then uh, you know you may get frustrated. Okay, so he has to go through you know nomination of prime minister. Uh, what if uh, you know Democratic Party doesn't you know endorse? So you know he has to go through assemblies through nomination of you know key you know, key members and implementing policies, and then unless opposition really cooperates with him, then he may get really frustrated, and then there may be temptation for him, uh, which I hope you know he wouldn't do that. Temptation to, uh, you know, use uh, prosecutor's office again uh, in launching new campaign to eradicate new evil in Korean society, and also there may be some pressure uh, from conservative side as well that you know because uh, they feel they were unfairly uh, punished by uh, the current government, so there may be certain pressure uh, to do something similar. So. Uh, you know, I'm sure now, you know, you know, his people now celebrating the victory, but he's, he'll be facing really tough, tough challenge. And given his lack of uh, experience in Korean politics, uh, frankly, I'm quite worried. And once again, I hope it doesn't happen. But frankly, I am quite worried that uh, we might see more tension and, and political fighting uh, in the coming months and, and years. So that's my uh, very honest assessment. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Stevens, um, I want to turn to you and just talk about once the once um, Yoon is inaugurated and his administration gets going, what, what do you think uh, his first priorities will be? You know, let's say looking at the 100 days. And also, I want to actually pick up something you, you mentioned earlier about sort of the people around him. I wonder if you might also be able to talk a little, a little bit about who might be in the Blue House with him. Um, you know, how is he going to, you know, who is he going to turn to, uh, you know, to get this governing agenda uh, done, um, including finding a way to work with, with the National Assembly? Yeah, well, on your last question first, that, 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 that's a great question. I actually don't have the answer to it. I mean, I, ha I have a sense about 
um, and Carl may have more insights because he's there in Seoul. I have a sense on the foreign policy team that, I mean, he assembled a kind of a foreign policy team during the campaign. I think some of those will move into positions, uh, you know, in the Blue House or in the ministries with him. More on the kind of political side and in the Blue House, I think there'll be a question as to what the role of the, the, the young chairman of the party is, uh, who uh, I think feels he deserves a lot of credit for bringing in the, 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 young, the young vote or the young men. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and also, of course, Anshul Su. But I'm going to deflect those to Carl, I think, because I think this is one of those questions. Uh, who are, you know, he, again, he comes out, doesn't come out of that political background. And, and how, are there actually people he can work with on the, uh, the, on the Democratic Party side, which does have the majority? Uh, like like Giuk, I'm 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 hope I'm I, I hope for the best, but I'm I'm not too optimistic. Um, with respect to priorities, you know, I think even more than a, a, a an American president, when you're when you're a president of South Korea, you know, and given the geopolitical climate we're in right now, he may not have the luxury of of <laughs> of, of following what might be his priorities. And, and also, I'm not sure he knows. Maybe I, I, I'm not sure he knows. But I would say, I, I, you know, clearly, uh, it's, we need to remind ourselves that, uh, that South Korea, although it's been quite successful, comparatively speaking, throughout the COVID-19, both in terms of public health and in terms of its economy, uh, it, it is experiencing a huge upsurge in, in cases now, milder cases, but nonetheless enormous. Um, it does have an economic impact as well as the impact of sanctions and so on and so forth for a trading nation. He's going to have to pay to the uh, pay attention to the economy that that's, you know, that's just kind of a no brainer, I guess. What he does is another question. I would also just mark that. I'm sorry, my lights just went out because I didn't move fast enough. Um, uh, he's, he's going to have to. Uh, uh, he's, he'll be mindful, or certainly his party will be mindful that local elections are happening on June 1st. He will be inaugurated May 10th. Local elections happen June 1st. Now, I think the practice in Korea is, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the president's not supposed to get involved in the local elections, but nonetheless, they are run on party lines. And there'll be great attention to, you know, even though June 1st and, you know, wh wh okay, what's different now? <laughs> Uh, uh, I think will be a question to uh, the, the what will be, then be the ruling party candidates as they run in local elections. And I guess, uh, I mean, final two points I would just make quickly on priorities. Whether, uh, I think it will, he will place a priority on, on establishing a, a relationship with President Biden on, on the U.S. relationship. Uh, there's already been a phone call. That's very traditional. That would have happened to wh whoever was, was president. But uh, there is some talk uh, here in Washington that, uh, although it has not been announced, that President Biden may be making a trip to, uh, to Asia in, in May uh, for perhaps a quad meeting in Tokyo. Tobias, you may know something about that. Uh, so of course, there's great speculation in Korea about an early summit. In any event, he will want an early summit. This would be quite early. Uh, and uh, would uh, I think he'll want to demonstrate that uh, notwithstanding the robust meeting that his predecessor had with President Biden last year, He's ready to take it uh, to uh, an even newer level, particularly with engagement uh, in the region in the context of the Indo-Pacific con uh, concept. And given the, the new complications of, uh, of geopolitical rivalry, including Russia. And finally, of course, there's North Korea. Uh, you know, I guess we're always safe to, to, to say at some point North Korea will do something. And they certainly ha have, have been you know, testing and, and uh, testing and they'll probably test in several senses uh, in the coming months. And uh, I think it'll be a priority for him to begin to assemble his team and uh, think about reacting. And again, he said some things that uh, uh, on the campaign trail that were uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty aggressive. Uh, and uh, that's something on which uh, clearly the US will be looking for, for you know, coordination and clarity and he'll need to assemble his team quickly. Great, thanks for for really a, a comprehensive answer, um, Carl. Uh, Mr. Carl, I want to turn to you. Um, want to if you want to pick up the themes that uh, Ambassador Stevens mentioned, but also um, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about what this means for the for the Democrats. Um, you know, they still have their you know they still control the National Assembly, of course, um, but you you know but they did just lose a presidential election by a slim margin. The leadership I saw, uh, the, the party leadership has, has said they're going to resign. Um, where do they go from here? What's the party's identity? What, you know, what did they take away from this? Because on the one hand, when you use an election, when you lose an election by a slim margin, you say, well, you know, it could have gone a lot of different ways. 
you know, do we, we don't really have to change that much. Or do they say, um, you know, we learned, you know, are, are there things we can take away from the Moon administration that we maybe did wrong, you know, mistakes that were made post-2020? What, where do they go from here? Uh, but feel free also, if you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the now, the soon to be ruling conservatives and, and some of the questions uh, Ambassador Stevens mentioned, feel free to take that up as well. Yeah, I mean, so as you mentioned, the first thing they're going to have to do is is look for new leadership. And you know, when we had we had talked about this panel, I had actually written that in, into my notes and didn't expect that the whole leadership would then resign, you know, thirty minutes before we we kick this off. Um, so yeah, we'll see see new leadership uh, uh, come in there, but also uh, yeah, they'll probably do a name change as well. So we can uh, look forward to calling them, you know, who knows who knows what, but something with a Democratic Party, maybe the more Democratic Party, uh, will will end up coming coming out of that. Um, but the one thing I think they really need to focus on and, and maybe kind of have a, have a reckoning about is that they have an incredibly thin bench, right? That's why we ended up with E.J. Young as the candidate, because there wasn't really anyone waiting in the wings of the party who was ready to kind of come out and establish themselves. There was, uh, at one point, there were a couple of people who may have done that, but you know, I think the, the most prominent was probably on Hee Jung, and he was convicted of, of raping his assistant and is, is, as far as I'm aware, still in prison. Um, and so when you only have one person on your bench, uh, you know, that's that's relatively thin. So, you know, maybe that's one of the, the criticisms that can be leveled against the Moon administration, especially within the party, is that it doesn't seem like he helped to develop any any young political talent or, or bring anyone up uh, with with him that, that would kind of step into that role. Um, so, you know, I think we're going to start seeing a lot of movement within the party. Uh, they'll they'll begin asking what kind of what kind of policy platform they're going to have to to. Uh, move into ahead of the 2024 National Assembly elections because they don't want to obviously turn the National Assembly over to the conservatives. So it's going to be a question of, of you know, how how much do they want to impede a, a new conservative uh, president? You know, and on the thin bench part, I, I should also note that that's not only true of the Democratic Party, right? That's also true of the PPP, which is exactly why they ended up with, with Yoon Song yeol as, as their candidate. You know, they, the conservatives were wiped out after the, the Park Geun-hye impeachment. And I can remember at that time, we were all essentially saying, you know, who's going to come up and lead the party? Is, is there really anyone that, that can, can come up and do this? And then it got even worse after the 2020 National Assembly elections where they were wiped out in a landslide. So both sides really don't have a, a lot of deep political leadership. So that's going to be something for, for both of them to develop. Now, you know, they, they do hold the, the, the super majority still within the National Assembly, and I think they're going to make it difficult for you. You know that you know is is he going to be able to advance his legislative priorities, which raises the question: uh, Does he have any legislative priorities? I think uh, both Ambassador Stevens and Dr. Shin alluded to that, and if he has them, I, I certainly haven't seen them. Um, but are, you know they're going to make his ministerial appointments, I think, uh, very difficult. Um, perhaps trying to in, embarrass uh, the the administration. And, you know, he can still appoint them without National Assembly approval, but I don't think they're going to really give way on that. Um, I also expect them, you know, despite the calls for, for national unity that we've heard suddenly on, uh, during the, the, the speech by, by President-elect Yoon at the end, um, you know, I, I fully expect the, the National Assembly to levy their investigative powers and, you know, start to dig in, either, either sniffing out or, or creating new scandals where, where, wherever they can. You know, I, I appreciate that President-elect has come out and, and called for national unity, but, you know, the national mood as far as, as what's what's showing up in the polling is the national mood is not for reconciliation. Uh, the national mood it seems to be more along the lines of trying to punish opponents. Now, maybe that was in the heat of election polling. So, you know, that, that those calls are, are listed lower. It's instead, people were saying we need to deal with real estate, we need to deal with economic growth. Uh, so maybe national unity will, will suddenly jump up as a priority. Uh, however, I, I, I tend to doubt it. Um, so I, you know, the question will be how uh, how obstructive do they want to be? And if they are, then as, as Dr. Shin mentioned, are we going to see Yoon then call on his people within the prosecution and also kind of the, the relatively newly created and, and apparently very high powered uh, corruption investigation office? And, and then perhaps we'll start to see that put in. And if that happens, I think uh, it could get could get quite ugly. Um, as far as his appointments, you know, I, I don't really have any insight to what's going to happen on the, the domestic side. 
I will say, however, that they do have to find a place for Anchel Su. And depending on, on just how much they actually value Anchel Su, I wonder if they could convince him to take uh, the prime ministership. It'd be a step up for him politically. But you know, that is that is an incredibly thankless job, especially for the next two years. Uh, can I uh, add a couple of points? Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> So I think regarding uh, you know both parties, uh, I may slightly disagree with Carl's assessments because uh, for Democratic Party, sure uh, now the leadership uh, resigned, uh, but if you look at uh, Mr. Song, uh, the former head, he wa- he wasn't really mainstream uh, you know within the Democratic Party, and E. J. Mao also has a very weak base uh, in the party, so. You know, one possibility is still uh, pro moon faction. They are the majority, and they might try to really come back to take over the leadership. So, you know, in the aftermath of election, and you know, of course, there's some reshuffling. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they might believe that uh, we have done pretty well because uh, you know those who won regime change it was more than fifty percent. So given that public sentiment, they may feel that we have done pretty well, that we should regroup. And then it's possible that this pro-moon mainstream faction may try to control the party. So that's one possibility we'll see. And on the other hand, actually the, the PPP also has a lot of problem because uh, it's like a coalition of anti-moon. And you know, initially, you know, Yoon wasn't their favorite because after all, it was you know, Yoon who you know, sent their former president Lee and Park into prison. But then they uh, believe that Yun has the best chance to beat Democratic Party candidate. So it's a kind of coalition of uh, anti moon forces. Now, Anchor Su, Yi Jun So, and, you know, Yun's base in the party also very thin. So we might, you know, see also some reshuffling uh, in PPP in, as well. So, uh, I don't know, you know, which way we'll go. I'm just raising some possibility that uh, we might see a lot of uh, movement uh, in both parties. And regarding some personnel, looks like a lot of people now are working at uh, Yunsi uh, camp or uh, those people who worked for Imyangba government. Okay, so I think some of policy, we might see something similar to what uh, Imyangba did, uh, maybe in a different way. So that's something I would say, so, yeah. Great, um, <clears throat> thank you really for you, you know, all of you for really um, uh, just phenomenal insight and, and analysis. I, I'm certainly learning a lot. Um, before we go to questions from the audience um, and many of those questions do concern foreign policy, which is really the next subject I wanted to delve into because I think you know, one takeaway from what we've discussed is given the possible constraints on uh, Yoon's ability to move a domestic agenda, uh, that a lot of the the area where he might make more of a difference is going to be in foreign policy. So I want to get more, maybe a little more of a sense of, of what we should expect. Um, Ambassador Stevens, I want to start with you, um, where, you know, clearly, I, you know, I think, um, you know, both candidates in their ways, you know, when we, we looked at the essays they submitted to foreign affairs and, and comments and debates and so on, I mean, there's there's definitely this attempt to try to calibrate the right distance between, you know, how do you cooperate with the US? What's the right distance from China? Um, you know, and, and Yoon, if we looked at his foreign affairs essay, I mean, he was harshly critical of Moon, you know, believing that Moon caved to China after, uh, you know, the THAAD informal boycott of South Korea and, you know, you know was much clearer on uh, wanting to bring South Korea into the quad and, and really uh, prioritizing closer cooperation with the United States. Um, but at the same time, you know, admitted that you know you had to find a way to to talk with China and communicate with China and and, and safeguard that relationship. So, um, wanted to ask you what we should expect in terms of how, once in office, how you might calibrate that relationship. You know, what what in practice uh, is that going to mean? You know, what should we expect uh, once once he's inaugurated? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I, I mean, I I, I do think that that. Yoon is going to uh, say what uh, the right things, if you like, for those who'd like to see a, a, a South Korea uh, be more decisively uh, supportive of, of US priorities and of prioritizing the alliance and of reconciling with Japan and uh, 
uh, being a little tougher on China, being more, you know, whatever the list is there that he kind of, I think he's going to say those things. I think he's going to be constrained in his ability to carry them out uh, by, by the, the same constraints that I think any Korean leader faces. And as I mentioned earlier, I think have only uh, been heightened by uh, uh, ongoing uh, developments in Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, but um, I, I do think that he will, and I, 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 I give a comment about bringing back some people from the Emil Bach administration or others. He's going to bring people, whatever administration, who have some experience uh, over the years. And I think this, I'm going to being prescriptive here now, I, I think his best chance of some success, I mean, even in this tough geopolitical climate, is the extent to which he can, um, sounding too much like a former ambassador now, but um, where, that he can, can, can forge a kind of a bipartisan foreign policy. Um, you know, of, and again, I think that, that whatever one thinks of specific, specific things that, that the Moon Jae-in government did vis-a-vis -vis that or whatever, uh, the prioritization of the alliance, uh, the U.S.-Korea alliance, the, the sense of that, that China is going in a direction that's going to require a more robust and kind of tougher and more skeptical uh, South Korean response is clearly supported in public polling. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think that there is a bipartisan understanding this needs to be done. So I would hope that I think that Pres President Yoon will, will strengthen his, his hand if he's able to make this a less partisan issue in South Korea. Now, you know, will the will the will the other party let him do that? I don't know, but I think that's something to work toward. Um, I wanted to go back, if you don't mind, I can't resist, even though you asked me about foreign policy, because others mentioned it too. In terms of his priorities, uh, others have alluded to it, but I just wanted to kind of put a sharp point on it because I've I've seen, as we all have, I mean, elections in Korea over the years, and there's so much I admire about Korean democracy. But I think the one great tragedy of it is not only since democratization, but since the founding of the Republic of Korea, no former Korean president has ever lived out his or her uh, post-presidency in, in peace. Uh, they have been exiled, jailed, sentenced to death, committed suicide. Uh, it's never happened. And again, almost putting aside whatever the, you know, the, 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 the various elements are, I think it would be a great step forward for Korea. And I was encouraged by what the president-elect had to say about this, but to see, it's gonna be very hard to do, but to see a period where this is not the priority going forward of, of righting past wrongs and, and resolving these issues, but moving forward. And with that, I think it will strengthen Korea's position internationally as well. Th thanks. I think I think that's a, a really point well taken. Um, uh, Dr. Shin, quickly, I just want to talk, um, and, and we did get a question from this in the Q&A, so I, I feel comfortable doing this. Um, if you want to um, maybe talk a little bit about what we should expect as far as North Korea is concerned. I mean, the situation right now, there's something of a deep freeze, um, certainly nothing really going on between the United States and North Korea as far as diplomacy is concerned. Um, I, I mean, I guess maybe the question um, with a conservative administration coming in now, I mean, given that that you know, communication is basically broken down. I mean, should we, you know, is it possible that things are going to get worse or are we just going to kind of be in this um, sort of not particularly satisfying status quo indefinitely now with North Korea maybe testing more? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, should we, should we expect sort of an active steps uh, by a UN administration that might uh, raise tensions with North Korea? Right. So uh, in this election, uh, North Korea wasn't an issue. Uh, kind of interesting because uh, you know North Korea kept testing you know missiles, but I don't think uh, it became uh, an issue in the campaign. And you know, you know, once again, you know, we may go back to uh, inter-Korea relations uh, under conservative administration like uh, Im Myung-bak or Park Geun-hye. So uh, we're gonna see more tension. But I think, in a sense, uh, Koreans are used to. So I don't think they will be alarmed or go crazy. <laughs> so, and then, but I think, you know, uh, you know, my main, uh, you know, concern is with China, not so much with North Korea. Okay, so, you know, certainly uh, his election is good news uh, for US and Japan. I'm sure he'll try to restore uh, relations with Japan. Uh, but I think he is facing big challenge uh, in terms of uh, dealing with China. Okay, so 
In this election, if there's any foreign policy issue, it was anti-China sentiment. And then you know that uh, there are controversy during Winter Olympic and both Lee and Yun came to you know, join the critical you know, course, right? So uh, on the one hand, sure, I mean, still China is very important. Uh, you can ignore or downplay the importance of China uh, to Korean economy. At the same time, there are two other forces. One is rise of anti-China sentiment. And now actually in recent polls, including ours, show that now uh, Korean attitude to, to China is more negative than Korean attitude towards Japan. Okay, so you have to deal with the public sentiment. And now I think recent uh, situation in Ukraine uh, may confirm uh, Koreans' uh, negative view against China, because now after all this Russia, China, you know, they are really uh, undermining uh, peace and you know, democracy in the world. And then also with ongoing tension between uh, US and China, I mean, there's a lot of pressure to uh, get away from uh, strategic ambiguity that current you know, government has been maintaining. So more pressure to side with the United States. So how, how you wanna reconcile, how you wanna navigate through that? I mean, it's going to be a really tough uh, situation in my view. And, you know, we have seen really, <laughs> in a bad relation between uh, Japan and Korea under the current government. I wouldn't be too surprised if we see something similar between Korea and China under new government. I hope once again, it doesn't happen. I don't want you know, to sound too negative, but then uh, it will be my view in you know, a main foreign policy challenge uh, for the new government. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shin. And, and you mentioned uh, Japan and I'm gonna, bring Carl, uh, Mr. Friedhoff in if see if he wants to um, maybe talk a little bit about what, what we should expect, um, in, you know, in terms of repairing, I think, a relationship that has really frayed quite badly uh, over the last five years. Um, and we heard during the campaign um, from you and, you know, lots of interest in improving relations with Japan. Um, Prime Minister Kishida's response was somewhat positive. And I think, you know, there's, there's certainly been signs, I think, of openness uh, to negotiations, even um, you know, recently under the Moon administration, you know, where there have been talks at various levels and, and foreign ministers have been have been talking. Um, so I just was wondering about, you know, do you feel, uh, you know, are there signs that there might actually be uh, some sort of possibility for a diplomatic breakthrough here, um, settling some of the issues? And I realize some of this has to do with uh, domestic political constituencies in both countries, you know, just what, what the governments can get away with. Um, and so, you know, you're sitting in Seoul, what do you have a sense? Do you think that that you know, do you feel optimistic under uh, the new administration that there, you know, and really a, a relatively new administration in Japan that we might see uh, a breakthrough relatively soon? I, I think breakthrough is probably a, a very strong word. Um, you know, and uh, at least though, I, I do hope that because Yoon is going to bring in with him a team that is quite experienced. Um, the person who I think is going to head a lot of the Japan work is very well connected in Japan, makes a lot of trips there and, and should be able to hopefully restore uh, some kind of shuttle diplomacy where they can you know, start to sort sort through some of these issues, but then also get back into certain levels of cooperation, especially on on the security side. And I, I think that is is some of the good news. You know, you talk about domestic political constraints. You know, I, I would hope to encourage the administration to start to to think about this in terms of where where things overlap. And when you when you look at public opinion in both countries, <clears throat> Dr. Shin just talked about negative views of China. Um, you know, that, that's something that the Japanese public shares as well in a lot of ways. And in, in recent polling we did in both countries, you know, 70% think that China either, either wants to replace the U.S. as the dominant world power, either in the region or in the world. Um, they, but by pretty broad majorities, think that China is more of an economic threat than a partner. And that's both countries. Both, both countries, more than 80% say that it's more of a security threat than a security partner. And, and I realize that they can't organize and around kind of this anti-China sentiment. But it's to kind of emphasize that there are they are seeing the region in very similar ways. Um, I think the one the one the one approach I, I would hope that they would take is to well, what is what would I, I would call the outside in approach that if they're going to cooperate on things, it shouldn't be close to home. It should actually be further away um, so that kind of, you know, that can help depoliticize it a little bit 
And, you know, again, in, in the polling, we see broad support uh, in both countries for cooperation on development projects in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think that would be relatively uncontroversial. Uh, you know, Japan is active there. I believe it's the largest aid uh, funder in the region. And Korea's, Korea, through its new Southern policy uh, under the Moon administration, I think that's something that is going to actually carry over. Uh, and I think that's a potential place for them to really start to think about how they work together, whether that's in the context or within the quad framework or, or outside of it. There's good work to be done there. And then there's also the issue of <clears throat> potential naval exercises. Uh, that's something that is actually supported in Korea, but not as broadly supported uh, in Japan. But if they were to go into the Indian Ocean or, or do anti-piracy exercises elsewhere, uh, that would be a place that, again, it gets them out of this region, uh, hopefully keeps them out of the headlines as, as much as they can, but gets them working together in ways that they're, they are currently not. And also, uh, you know, doing those kind of naval exercises may give them experience working together, whether it's anti-submarine uh, uh, exercises are, uh, as well. And then that also can help uh, build confidence in dealing with the North Korean threat together. So there are areas where the public's overlap, where things would probably not be controversial, uh, and that, that they could perhaps uh, try to push forward on just to get the ball rolling. But yeah, a, a diplomatic breakthrough, I, I think, is probably a, a step too far for the moment. Well, we can, we'll take kind of tempered, cautious optimism. Um, I, I, yeah, certainly better than the way things have been. Um, I have a few questions um, that I'm going to put to all of you and... Um, you know, we can just sort of jump in, you know, if you if you have thoughts. Um, one question was asked, so, um, someone asked whether the candidates addressed the war in Ukraine and whether there was a public debate on a uh, connection between China's support for Russia uh, and what that could mean for security and territorial integrity in Asia. And, you know, and, and I would sort of add sort of a, as a, an additional note, I mean, you know, maybe th there are questions in this play, maybe played into uh, Yoon's critique of Moon, you know, regarding um, Moon, uh, South Korea's place in the world, you know, and is South Korea you know, playing a role as a leading democracy or not? And is it going to be able to play that role? Um, and so th th leave this for anyone to, uh, to jump in on. Well, I don't think there was a lot in the campaign. I, I do recall at one point, Lee Jae Myung um, sort of said something that got him into a little bit of trouble and stepped back, I think, Carl, you're there about Ukraine is far away from us or has nothing to do with us. And he kind of had to explain that. But, I, you know, my sense is, and again, Carl, you would know better, is that the Koreans were a little bit, if you like, kind of distracted by their own, you know, their own election. Uh, but at, in the Moon administration itself, uh, again, as thinking about not just China, but Russia, uh, which it also sees as playing, you know, an important, potentially important role vis-a-vis -vis the Korean Peninsula going forward. And uh, it took them a little, a little while to respond, and they did, to the, the joining of the sanctions regime. And uh, so I think this was a subject of some, some controversy, both here in Washington and also in Korea, that uh, unlike the Japanese, they didn't step right out. But again, it's probably a, a, a sign of some of the other, other things we've been talking about of, of Korea, whether under a Moon administration, or I would say under a Yoon one, would a Yoon one respond more quickly of, of trying to uh, uh, think through uh, the implications uh, for its trade dependent economy, its energy sources, all the rest of it, as well as the uh, great power competition. Yeah, to, to follow up on, on that quickly, uh, the, there were quotes out of, out of E.J. Myung on, on Ukraine that, you know, Ukraine is far away and yet it affects us. Um, I, you know, that was the headline. I actually went, went through and read kind of the longer quote. I think that the quote was slightly out of context. I didn't think he was being dismissive about it, but later he did, he did talk about uh, that the reason that Ukraine was invaded was because Zelensky was a novice. Um, and so therefore it would be dangerous to put anyone without political experience in a position of leadership and that he did have to, to apologize for. I think for me, as I mentioned uh, you know, earlier, uh, I don't think there's any direct influence, but maybe indirectly once again, conforming uh, public sentiment that uh, now better to side with US and the West not China or Russia. So I think there's some uh, indirect impact on public opinion, uh, if not directly 
uh, making an uh, you know, impact on uh, Korea policy. So we have another question that's something of, a, of looking for a point of information, and that is, was there uh, any discussion of, of the key role that South Korea plays in supply chains, particularly for semiconductors uh, during the campaign? Did the you know, did candidates take any stance on that, um, that that you're aware of? I didn't see any of that, um, as far as just a discussion of their role in, in the global supply chains. I mean, if I, cause I think that's an example of a kind of issue on which I think there's 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 a, a kind of a consensus on a policy that will go forward. I think, you know, regardless of, of who won, but I think Mr. Yoon will certainly continue this. There'll be a pretty mm -hmm. robust cooperation that's, that's already been started with the U.S. and others. I mean, Japan's an important part of this, too, that needs to be worked on uh, on on issues like that. Yeah. Uh, so we're coming up on our final minutes. I have a lot more questions I'd like to ask, um, and I'm not going to be able to ask them, but I'm going to ask, I want to ask maybe a, a retrospective question to all of you to finish this up. And that is, so we've talked a lot about what maybe what to expect from the new administration. Um, I'd like to ask you all for your thoughts about how, what, what would the legacy of the Moon administration be? Um, you know, that I think there were great hopes for Moon in 2017. You know, of course, this party won a big victory in 2020. Um, but but what do you think um, when we look back at Moon and, and his time in office, uh, how how will he be remembered? I guess uh, in one word, uh, election of President Yoon, right? It's a basically Moon and his government who made him president. I mean seriously, because five years ago, who would have expected right Yoon to become new president? I don't think anyone. I mean, he was only the mid senior level prosecutor, and then you know Moon gave promotion to you know, in promotion right, you know, you know prom promoting you know Yun to take in charge of Seoul District uh, Prosecutor Office and then uh, Prosecutor General. So uh, I mean, that's why I keep saying that you know, I've been warning about you know backsliding of current democracy, and frankly speaking. Uh, can you imagine any, you know, advanced democracy, you know, former prosecutor general could become president representing part, you know, person party, right? I mean, so, I mean, you, you can think about it in a general way. So I think that's probably main legacy of Moon Jae-in, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, you know, later. So let's just stop there. Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm imagining a democracy uh, uh, electing an unlikely person. I mean, I, I actually was in Seoul in 2016 when when Mr. Trump was announced as the winner, and uh, uh, that seemed, you know, very unlikely, even unthinkable at the time. So I, I, I think that the Korea and, and all democracies are 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 in a different state right now. Um, I would say on the moon, the moon administration, maybe to be slightly more positive, I think clearly the notion now at, at mildest would be disappointment that because the expectations were so high. Remember he was elected one night, he came into the office the next day and expectations were sky high. Maybe Mr. Yoon will benefit from really, really low expectations, at least initially. And Mr. Moon is leaving office with, uh, comparatively speaking, historically speaking, uh, a fairly positive, uh, not to say that it's in the over 50%, but a fairly positive approval rating. So perhaps history will be a little kinder to him. Uh, but I do think there's the broader narrative, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Shin has pointed out, of, of the future of democracy. And there, I think I, I can find both good news and bad news, uh, I guess, in the, uh, uh, in, in the current state of things in Korea. The, uh, the final point I would make is I was really struck with a kind of a retrospective thing by how the uh, this, a sign I was in Korea in December uh, when the campaign was sort of beginning, at least unofficially. And the sign that was being used everywhere and it was used for polls, too, was a uh, the change of regime, literally, right? And, uh, and, and Carl knows there's a lot of polling and people said is that the polling for people who want a change of regime, meaning, you know, meaning a transfer of power to the, uh, the other party happened. Uh, if, if, if people more than 50% said they wanted that, then that was really going to mean a, a Yoon victory. And, and people watched that very closely. And the reason I mention it is because I first saw that in Korean as a sign in the 1980s 
against the Chandu Wan administration when it was the slogan which was taken down by the police of the protesters in the street. So in a very long, a somewhat longer uh, uh, political perspective, I take that as a maturation of Korea's democracy, but at the same time, um, the, uh, you know, the kind of political engagement that does does exist in Korea and that ha that still is, is, is I think, disappointed by, uh, by its leadership uh, so many times. Our last word, we're a little over, but but last word goes to you. Yeah, you know, there's it's it has been a mixed mixed presidency, and you know, of course, any president is going to to end up uh, like that. But one one uh, I think one not so positive, uh, probably a negative vote for domestically. A lot of people will remember him for is just uh, the real estate market, the skyrocketing home prices, and how that really affected, uh, especially young people, twenties and their thirties, and their outlook uh, on their their own futures. Uh, here. But on the other side, I think, you know, it's not, we're not talking about it now, but five or 10 years when they really start to dig into this, uh, one of the big positives is going is to be his handling of the pandemic. The fact that, you know, deaths remain so low. Yes, there's a big wave of cases now, but essentially, you know, it's still less lethal than it was. And if you look around, um, yeah, small and small and medium sized enterprise, small and medium sized enterprises, they, they suffered throughout. But in terms of protecting lives, uh, his administration did quite well at that. Well, uh, really, uh, really, I, I, I hearty thanks to all of you, uh, Ambassador Stevens, Dr. Shin, Mr. Friedhoff. Thank you for sharing your insights with us on, on really, I think, an important moment for uh, South Korea and its democracy. Um, thank you again to our events team and uh, really uh, gratitude and gratitude to our guests for their questions. Um, and uh, look forward to speaking with you all again soon, maybe a follow-up at some point about how Yoon is performing in office. So thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you.